thank you for having me here to speak today. My name is Maggie Lewis. I'm a PhD student in Dr. Kelly Hamby's lab at the Maryland Department of Entomology. And today I'm gonna to be giving you an update on some of the work that our lab has been doing to advance management of spotted wing Drosophila. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with this pest, spotted wing Drosophila or SWD is an invasive vinegar fly that has recently emerged as a primary pest in a number of soft skin fruit crops here in the mid-Atlantic region, particularly fall bearing raspberries and blackberries. Unlike other species of Drosophila, female SWD do have this serrated ovipositor, which allows them to cut directly through the intact skin of ripening fruit when they lay their eggs. Um, so if we look at spotted wing Drosophila's life cycle, once the female flies deposit their eggs within the fruit, the larvae will hatch within one to two days and then develop within the fruit tissue, going through three developmental stages or instars before eventually pupating. At this point, we don't fully understand where spotted wing Drosophila pupates. It's possible on some occasion we will find pupa within the fruit, but recent studies have also suggested that the larvae will actually exit the fruit and drop to the ground where they complete that part of their life cycle before eventually emerging as adults. And then that entire process will repeat. Keep in mind that this entire process of egg to adult development only takes between 10 to 15 days, depending on the temperature, which means that spotted wing Drosophila populations can build up very rapidly over the course of a single growing season, particularly if you're not managing for them. In terms of the damage that spotted wing Drosophila can cause, it is possible for the female flies to cause some cosmetic scarring to your fruit um, through egg laying, particularly if you're growing firmer fruits like cherries or blueberries. In those cases, you may actually see small dimples that are from the egg laying wounds, and if you squeeze it, sometimes a small droplet of juice will exude. That being said, the main concern with spotted wing Drosophila does come from the larval life stage. Because the larvae are developing within the fruit tissue, as they get bigger, they will cause the fruit tissue to soften and eventually collapse, causing pretty visible damage. And it's also possible that both larval feeding and egg laying could introduce fungal pathogens, which again could be another source of crop damage. Um, currently, management options for spotted wing Drosophila are limited. And while there is a lot of active research going on both in our lab group, as well as other research groups across the country, mm -hmm. looking at various cultural, biological, and monitoring controls, at this point, broad spectrum insecticides do remain one of the primary management tactics that are available for this pest. And depending on the severity of your infestation, you may need to spray as frequently as every one to two weeks to achieve consistent control. Um, with insecticides, it's important to keep in mind that they are primarily targeting the adult flies. So what this means is that if you have fruit that's already been infested with spotted wing Drosophila, your insecticide spray is not gonna have any impact on those larvae. And those larvae will eventually complete their life cycle and emerge to replace that adult generation that you had knocked back. Um, the good news is there are a number of different insecticide options that are available for controlling spotted wing Drosophila, including various different types of spray groups, such as the pyrethroids, the spinosins, the organophosphates, and the carbamates. Um, if you are spraying for spotted wing Drosophila, you want to try and remember to rotate what group of insecticide you're using as frequently as possible, since this will help delay the onset of insecticide resistance. Um, I did want to remind you too that our lab has produced a series of crop specific spray tables that can provide a fairly useful starting guide for making spray decisions. Um, and I know this is a little hard to read, but these tables are available on our lab website, hambylab.weebly.com, and that address should be on the handout that we've included in your folder. So on these tables, you'll see um, for the different crops that are affected by spotted wing Drosophila, various insecticide options that have been registered for use um, in your different IRAC resistant groups, as well as information on various application parameters, such as the re-entry interval, the pre-harvest interval. And then we also have these rankings on the product's efficacy, which was developed based on um, a number of insecticide spray trials. One thing to keep in mind is that um, while we do encourage you to use this table as a starting point, you always want to make sure to go back and refer to the pesticide label. That label is a legal document, so you do have to follow any restrictions or regulations that are listed on there. And it is possible that the um, registration has changed since the time that these spray tables were published. Um, so there are a number of factors that can impact the efficacy of a given insecticide application. One area that our lab has been interested in over the past couple of years is spray coverage. 
So spray coverage provides a measure of how thoroughly your insecticide is going to coat the fruit and foliage in your target plant. And in both raspberries and blackberries, achieving high levels of spray coverage throughout the plant may be difficult. These crops tend to have a very dense vegetative canopy that can potentially block pesticide dispersion and lead to these stratified deposition patterns where the majority of the insecticide residue is deposited in that outer plant canopy, leaving the inner region largely unsprayed. And with spotted wing drosophila in particular, this could be problematic for control. Previous studies in both raspberries and blackberries have demonstrated that the adult flies tend to have higher activity levels and egg laying rates in both that inner and lower plant canopy region. So these same areas that are potentially receiving suboptimal spray coverage. So with that in mind, um, I'm, today I'm gonna go over some of the work that our lab has been doing to try and understand how spray coverage plays into spotted wing drosophila IPM programs. So I'm gonna start by going over some laboratory bioassays in which we wanted to understand how spray coverage actually impacts management of spotted wing drosophila. Is it making a difference in terms of how well you're controlling the adult flies or larval infestation rates? And then for the latter part of the talk, I'll go over some of the field work we've been doing to try and think about ways that we can potentially improve spray coverage within these fruiting systems. So in our laboratory bioassays, we sprayed um, store-bought raspberries individually with either Mustang Max or water as an untreated control inside our laboratory fume hood. To, count, to account for differences in insecticide concentration due to different carrier water volume application rates, we also repeated these bioassays twice using both a high and low insecticide concentration. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with carrier water volume, this is simply a measure of how much water you're diluting your insecticide into prior to spray. So for example, if you were gonna spray at a 50 gallon per acre application rate, you could add four fluid ounces of Mustang Max to a 50 gallon tank of water and spray it over a one acre plot of land. Or you could add those four fluid ounces to a 100 gallon tank of water and still spray it over a single acre of land. In both cases, you're delivering the same amount of active ingredient. You're simply changing how much water it's getting diluted into. Um, this video here is just showing you our typical bioassay setup. So we used this preval paint canister sprayer to actually apply the insecticide treatments, since it seemed to apply a spray pattern that was pretty similar to what we were observing in the field. And it, essentially we moved the sprayer along this nine inch track and passed by our single raspberry fruit. Um, to create variation in the spray coverage, we then adjusted the speed that the sprayer was moving, moving it either faster or lower to generate these different levels of coverage. And with these methods, we were able to generate two spray coverage treatment, a high coverage rate of about 85% and a low spray coverage rate of about 20%. Um, and these rates were on par with the high and low end of spray coverage that we typically would observe under field conditions. Once the raspberries had been treated, we, loaded, we let the pesticide residues dry, and then we loaded them into bioassay arena cups along with five spotted wing drosophila from our laboratory colony. We held the flies in those cups for 24 hours, and then were able to go and make several different assessments of spotted wing drosophila fitness. Um, the first thing that we quantified was larval infestation using sugar flotation methods. And what we found is that when raspberries were sprayed with Mustang Max, larval infestation was very low, with less than one larvae per female counted on average. And this was true regardless of whether we used the high or low spray coverage um, treatments. So what this is suggesting is that it's possible that even small amounts of insecticide are deterring oviposition in spotted wing drosophila. Um, the other thing that we quantified was ad adult mortality. So we went and counted the number of dead adult flies 24 hours after exposure. Um, and here we've actually found that our spray coverage treatments did make a difference. So just to give you a sense of what this looked like, here I'm showing the average percent mortality plus the standard error um, on the y-axis for both our 50 and 100 gallon per acre bioassays. And we have our different insecticide treatments, our untreated control and our Mustang Max on the x-axis with the different colored bars showing the high and low spray coverage treatments respectively. You can see that when the raspberries were treated with Mustang Max, um, we did see the significant decrease in percent mortality as we went from this high to low spray coverage rate. In particular, at the 100 GPA bioassays, um, we had about 75 to 80% coverage when we were at 70 to 80% mortality at this high spray coverage treatment, and that dropped to about 40% at that low spray coverage treatment. 
Um, so with these bioassays, what we were able to demonstrate is that um, when you have lower spray coverage, you are not as effectively killing adult spotted wing Drosophila. And so what this means is that if you are getting reduced spray coverage on your farm, particularly in this inner plant canopy region, it is possible that you're creating a refuge that's allowing adult flies to survive repeated insecticide applications. Um, so given these bioassays, we have switched the focus of our, um, on this project to start thinking about how we can improve spray coverage within raspberry and blackberry production systems. And as a first step, we decided to conduct demonstration trials to see what levels of spray coverage are typically being observed in commercial production. In these trials, we went out to commercially managed raspberry and blackberry patches and measured spray coverage using each farm's equipment and standard application practices. Um, we, also, we deployed white paper spray cards in both the inner and outer plant canopy of these plants at three different heights, ranging from one and a half to four feet above the ground, giving us a total of six spray cards per plant. And by putting so many spray cards in a single plant, we were able to quantify both the rate of spray coverage and also think about how it varied spatially throughout the plant canopy. We also added a pink marker dye to the tank mix, so when this dye came in contact with our spray cards, it would stain them pink and we could then go in after application, collect the cards, and bring them back to our lab where we use computer software to calculate the percentage of the card that was pink, giving us a measure of the percent spray coverage. This graph here is showing the range of average percent spray coverage observed in each of our six canopy locations across three demonstration trials. So for example, if you look at this lowest inner card location, you can see that average percent spray coverage ranged from about six to 22%. Um, overall, we found the spray coverage rates were highly variable, but there were several trends that appeared consistently. First, spray coverage did tend to be lower in the inner plant canopy relative to the outer. So for example, if we look at this top card height, you can see that in the inner region, average coverage ranged from about 30 to 52%. But once we moved to that outer location, those numbers jumped to a range of 60 to 85%. And this is probably due to the fact that the um, foliage in both the raspberry and blackberry plants was blocking pesticide spray dispersion, so most of the product was getting um, deposited in the outer canopy. The other thing that we noticed is that spray coverage did tend to be lower in the bottom half of the plant canopy relative to the upper. And so both of these trends are potentially concerning for spotted wing drosophila management, because again, what we're seeing is that we're, having, we're generally getting the lowest levels of spray coverage in those same canopy regions that also have higher levels of adult activity. Um, in addition to potentially allowing flies to survive insecticide treatments, it is possible that these sublethal levels of insecticide exposure could be contributing to the development of insecticide resistance, though this is not something we have yet observed here in Maryland. Um, and so through these demonstration trials, we were able to identify several targets um, or areas that we should potentially focus on for improving spray coverage. And so to start addressing that, we have been conducting spray coverage trials out here at the University of Maryland Research Farms, both at the Queenstown and the Keatesville site. Um, and in these trials, we've been specifically focusing on one aspect of insecticide application, um, carrier water volume, and seeing how that could potentially influence spray coverage patterns. Um, the reason we decided to focus on carrier water volume is because there's been several studies in other systems, including strawberries and grapes, that have demonstrated that increasing your carrier water often correlates with higher levels of spray coverage. And in particular, in strawberries, researchers have demonstrated that using a higher carrier water volume does seem to improve spray coverage in that inner plant canopy region, which could potentially be beneficial for spotted wing drosophila. So over the course of the past three years, we have um, sprayed raspberries and blackberries with insecticides at both a 50 and 100 gallon per acre application rate. Um, and we repeated these trials using different types of equipment, including an air blast sprayer, a CO2 powered backpack sprayer, and an air blast sprayer with a two-sided row crop head attached. Um, just for reference, the row crop head is the structure here that's been mounted on top of the air blast sprayer's fan. Um, it's essentially a piece of equipment that's been designed to act as a shield. So it helps direct the pesticide spray downwards, so more of it's actually hitting your plant canopy instead of drifting overhead. Um, again, we deployed spray cards in multiple <coughs> locations throughout the plant canopy and used a pink marker dye to quantify percent spray coverage. Um, overall, we found that when plants were sprayed with either the air blast or the CO2 backpack sprayer, spray coverage was generally higher in both the outer and upper plant canopy, 
um, consistent with what we had previously observed in our demonstration trials. We also found that in general, um, when you increased your carrier water volume, there was higher levels of spray coverage in the outer plant canopy, but unfortunately effects were less consistent in that inner region. Um, that being said, when we looked at spray coverage improvements across height, we did see that um, the most consistent improvements in spray coverage due to carrier water volume generally occurred in the lower plant canopy. Um, and just to give you a sense of what that looked like, um, here I'm showing you results from air blast sprayer trials that were conducted in 2016 and 2017. So in these graphs, I have the average percent spray coverage plus the standard error on the y-axis again um, for both the inner and outer plant canopy with the different years of the trial in the x-axis. And the different colored bars are the 50 and 100 gallon per acre application treatments. You can see that in both years of the study and in both the inner and outer plant canopy, as we went from this 50 to 100 gallon per acre application rate, we did see significant improvements in percent spray coverage at this lowest card height. Um, for example, in 2017, spray coverage increased from about 35% to almost 60% with the 100 GPA application. Um, the reason that we probably saw the most consistent improvement in the lower plant canopy compared to these upper and middle regions probably has to do with the fact that we're already achieving pretty good spray coverage in that higher part of the canopy at baseline, which just means that there's a lot more room for improvement in the lower canopy to begin with. The other thing that we found is that when we added the two-sided row crop head to our air blast sprayer, it seemed to make a pretty substantial difference in terms of the spray coverage that we were receiving. Um, with this equipment, we saw no differences in spray coverage between either the inner or outer plant canopy. And we also saw no differences between the 50 or 100 gallon per acre, per acre application rate. Um, and so what this is potentially suggesting is that in addition to optimizing carrier water volume, it may be possible to improve spray coverage or troubleshoot it by making other minor adjustments to your sprayer setup. Um, which actually segues really nicely into the last part of my talk, where I just wanted to go over some other um, tactics to consider when you're troubleshooting spray coverage and trying to optimize it in your own operation. Um, as a first step, we do recommend evaluating spray coverage in your own farm. Um, as I mentioned, spray coverage does seem to be a pretty variable measurement. And so really going out and seeing what types of coverage levels you're getting with your sprayer is going to be the best way to identify regions that are problematic. There are several ways that you can measure spray coverage. Water sensitive spray cover cards are available commercially. Um, these are just yellow pieces of paper that will change color from yellow to blue whenever a liquid comes in contact with the card. Um, and they're pretty nice to use because um, there is a lot of support for them. And in particular, there are several free phone apps that have been developed to help you analyze them. For example, Christian Nansen out at UC Davis has developed Smart Spray, which is a phone app where you just take a picture of your spray card, and then it'll use a computer algorithm to give you a measure or an estimate of the percent coverage. One thing to keep in mind with these water sensitive spray cards is that because they are water sensitive, they're, not gonna, they're gonna change color in response to both the liquid coming out of your sprayer, but also any other ambient water that you have in your field. So this could include rainfall, of course, but also less obvious sources of moisture, such as higher humidity conditions or dew drop on your plants from the night before. Um, so because of that, if you do decide to use water sensitive spray cards, you wanna be um, mindful of when and where you're deploying them and just be aware that you could potentially um, have artificially high levels of spray coverage using this method. Um, because of the issues with the water sensitive spray cards, um, our lab decided to use a marker dye as an alternative. The advantage of using a marker dye is that it's not water sensitive. So it does give you a lot more flexibility in terms of when you're deploying your spray cards. And you don't have to worry about um, residual moisture contaminating your, your readings. Um, if you are interested in evaluating spray coverage in your own operation and would like to learn more about this marker dye system, I did want to mention that our lab will be conducting spray coverage evaluations for the 2020 field season. Um, so we could come out to your farm, deploy spray cards, give you some of the dye, and then analyze the cards for you after you make an application. If this is something you'd be interested in doing, um, my contact information is on the handout that we've given you. So please feel free to get in touch with me and I'm happy to talk about it and provide you with some more information. Oh, whoops. All right. 
Um, so the good news is once you have identified regions within your plant canopy that are problematic in terms of spray coverage, there are several different approaches that can potentially be deployed to um, improve your coverage rates. One thing to consider is your canopy management. So particularly if you're growing raspberries or blackberries and you have all your canes bundled very tightly together, um, that's probably going to create more of a barrier that will block the pesticide spray and lead to these stratified deposition patterns with minimal spray in the inner plant region. Um, opening up the plant canopy through strategies such as trellising or potentially pruning could therefore help improve spray penetration throughout the entire plant. Another thing to be mindful of is the environmental conditions during your pesticide application. Um, so particularly if you're using an air blast sprayer or some other type of equipment that's producing fine droplets, you want to try and avoid spraying during high wind conditions. Since the wind is going to contribute to pesticide drift, which means more of the spray is going to drift off into the air and not reach your target plant. Um, beyond wind, other factors that can impact drift include temperature or humidity. So higher temperature, lower humidity conditions will increase pesticide evaporation, which again will contribute to drift. Um, in addition to being mindful about the environmental conditions when you spray, you also want to try and make sure that when you're calibrating your sprayer, you're, do you're doing it under conditions that are going to be similar to when you're applying your pesticide, since that will help you have a more accurate calibration. Um, if you're using an air blast sprayer, something else to consider is the direction of the air coming out of your sprayer, um, particularly if you're spraying raspberries or other crops that are low to the ground. You want to make sure the air is being directed into your target plant canopy instead of shooting overhead. Um, one way that you, there's several ways that you can do this. One option is to run water through the sprayer and have someone stand outside and observe what direction the water is going. This will give you a pretty crude estimate. Um, the other thing you can try is tying ribbons onto your nozzles and running the sprayer again and seeing what direction the ribbons fly. Um, if you do decide to go with the ribbon approach, you just want to make sure you're using a firmer ribbon and not flagging tape since the force from the air blast sprayer could shear the flagging tape, um, creating a plastic confetti in your field. And the other thing to think about is you want to make sure that the ribbons are short enough that they're not going to get sucked into the intake for the sprayer fan. Um, once you have determined what direction your air is being directed, um, you can adjust that airstream by changing the angle of the deflectors, which are these um, structures here on top of the air blast sprayer fan. Um, another thing to consider is adding an adjuvant to your tank mix, um, such as a spreader or sticker. Spreader stickers are a product that break, disrupt the surface tension within water droplets. So if you add a spreader sticker to your tank mix, what it's going to do is it's going to make sure that when the spray droplets come in contact with the leaves, instead of remaining in this nice droplet form, it'll actually break and better spread over the leaf tissue. Beyond that, there are a number of other factors that you could play around with. Um, for example, adjusting the ground speed. If you drive the tractor a little slower, it may help with the spray coverage. Though keep in mind, if you change the ground speed, you probably will need to recalibrate the sprayer. Um, other things could include the sprayer height or the nozzle, adjusting the nozzle of the angles. Um, again, trying to make sure that the spray is being directed into your target plant canopy. Overall, spray coverage does seem to be a very variable measurement. And unfortunately, I don't think there's any single best way to improve spray coverage. It's really going to be dependent on your operation and the equipment that you're using. So again, probably the best approach is going to be to measure spray coverage on your own farm and make the adjustments until you get levels that you're happy with. Um, that's all I have for you today, but I did want to point out that if you would like to learn more information about the sprayer calibration, um, there is a really good website, sprayers101.com. And again, that website has been put on the handout. This is a website maintained by a nonprofit organization in Canada that has a lot of really useful information about maintaining and calibrating different types of sprayers, including air blast and broom, boom sprayers. And in particular, if you're using an air blast sprayer, they, this group has developed a handbook, Air Blast 101, that is available for download as a PDF or an ebook. And again, it has a lot of really useful information specifically to air blast sprayers. Beyond that, I mentioned that we have a lab website, hambylab.weebly.com, where you can find our spray um, crop-specific spray tables, as well as information about both the spray coverage work and some of the other spotted wing drosophila work that's going on in our lab, and contact information for both myself and my advisor, Dr. Kelly Hamby. And so with that, I'd like to briefly thank everyone who helped, um, particularly our grower collaborators and our funding sources. 
And I'm happy to take questions if there's time. Any questions for Maggie? Yes. Yeah. So, are we ever going to come up with a, uh, 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 a method to control these insects without having to spray weekly? Um, that's a good question. And so the question was, are we going to be able to come up with a control method to control spotted wing without having to spray weekly? Um, and my answer is hopefully. Um, there's a lot of research groups that are working towards that, and they're trying a lot of different approaches. Um, for example, people out in Michigan are looking at using um, netting and shade houses as a way of excluding spotted wing drosophila. There's other people that are working on trapping um, or attracting kill technologies. Um, so it's not there yet, but hopefully that's the goal. Yeah. Biocontrol? Um, yep, so people are working on biocontrol as well. Um, I believe out at the USDA facility in Delaware, they are looking at some of the parasitoids that are native to southeastern Asia where spotted wing drosophila can come from. Um, but again, it's a slow process because they have to do a lot of testing to make sure that they're going to be effective and that they're not going to have a negative impact on native species that are already here. But that is definitely something people are looking into. Okay. And if you look, the one thing people are talking about is to narrow the rows down, especially in the raspberries, go with a single row so you don't have as much foliage. Have you looked at any different management or, or, or techniques? that can be used. I saw you had a nice slide up there where you mm -hmm. sort of split, split the row and then sh you can put a nozzle up top and shoot down. Mm -hmm. uh, cultural techniques that seem to be making a difference. Have you followed that at all in any in-depth study? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, so the question was um, about cultural techniques or row management to try and open up the canopy. And actually, I'm not involved in that project personally, but we do have some personnel in our lab that are currently evaluating different trellising systems. Um, and right now the main focus is seeing if we can make um, microclimates that are less hospitable to spotted wing drosophila. But I believe they're also thinking about doing some spray coverage work this summer. Um, and so again, if you'd like to find out more information about that, you know, I would check out our lab website because there is some links to that project. Any more questions for Maggie? Oh, one, one last question. Yeah. So, locally, how can we decide when to start spraying for spotted wing drosophila? Um, so that's a good question. So the question was, how should we decide when to start spraying for spotted wing drosophila locally? Um, and so probably your best bet is going to be um, checking the fruit periodically for infestations. I think, and once you start seeing evidence of larval infestation in your fruit, you can start spraying. So we don't have degree day information on this test? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. We wouldn't start spraying when the fruit starts to color. Um, again, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I think it's going to depend on what fruit you're, what fruit you're talking about. Um, because earlier in the season, um, spotted wing drosophila infestations tend to be lighter. So for example, we grow both fall and spring bearing raspberries. And in many cases, we don't start to see spotted wing drosophila in our spring fruit until the very end of their fruiting. So really your best bet if you want to avoid unnecessary sprays is going to be checking it before you make those decisions. If the pupa are possibly falling on the ground, mm -hmm. could there be some way of treating that? Um, so the question was, if the pupa are falling on the ground, is there a way of treating that? Um, and again, that's a great question. There is some research groups that are looking at different mulching options to see if we can create microclimates that are, again, less favorable, favorable for pupil survival. Um, and that's actually something that our lab has been working on in the past. So I don't think it's there yet, but it's something that's in progress. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you, Maggie. Thank you. Thank you.